that time, you know what to do. Put your hands together, make some noise, and welcome your host and moderator at Build, Vicky Camilleri, and today's guest, Neil Patrick Harris. Thanks, everybody. What up? One more time, Neil Patrick Harris. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I like the new digs. This is very cool. Yeah. You are our, really like our first guest. I feel like I'm on TRL. Oh, <laughs> cool. Like a new TRL. Like a new, new TRL, TRL, yeah. Like Just, a newer, cooler TRL. Can the people outside see in? I don't, or, are they, I don't or is it all darkened? I think it's a little dark. Two -way we don't really want them of. gawking too much. Nice. Hi. Neil, thanks so much Hi. for being here, man. Congratulations thanks. on a series of unfortunate events. Hey, thank you very much. We're very excited. We filmed it uh, months and months ago, and it took months and months to film, and we, we were under shrouded in secrecy, so uh, we weren't able to tweet any pictures or show anything, and so here we are today, right now. You can stream it all. Well, you guys did an incredible job. Take me back to the beginning of the project. I'm assuming you're, you know, you're a parent. I'm assuming you're a fan of the books. Was there a certain importance to the project for you? Were you going into it being like, well, what are you guys going to do? Because I want to make sure we respect the books as much as we can. I actually hadn't read any of the books when the project came my way. I had just finished doing a variety show for NBC that was me being myself in a sort of voracious way. Lots of little segments of game show and hidden camera and stunts. And it was just a lot of me seeing my own face. And so then, uh, can, Conveniently and coincidentally, this project was around, uh, and they were getting greenlit by Netflix, and so it was kind of an interesting, creative, perfect storm for me. They, they asked if I'd be interested in, in Olaf. I love the idea of looking nothing like myself and doing something really transformative. Um, I love the idea, once I heard that it was an opportunity, then I read the book, then I read one of the scripts, and they were very, very similar, and I appreciated that they were wanting to make the project uh, on camera look as much like uh, as, as truthful and faithful to the books as possible. So that seemed like a, an asset. And, um, and I have kids of my own that are six, and so I think it's fun to be able to be in something that plays to more than one demographic. Have they, have they seen any of it yet? Yeah, they saw the first two episodes. Uh, they actually saw the first two episodes on set. They did a cast and crew filming. Uh, a, a screening of it with the, with the, uh, with everyone the last the second to the last day of shooting, and the kids had been been around, so they they liked it. They thought it was funny. So they could recognize you. They'd already seen you in costume. And they yeah, could... for sure. Well, they live here in New York, and we film in Vancouver, and so I would Facetime with them every day. It, as in Count very Olaf. weird guises. Sometimes Count Olaf, sometimes Stefano, sometimes Shirley. That how was did, a hoot. How, how, do, how did that usually go? Do you have to explain who you, like, who you are? Do they freak out or do they know it's you right away in costume? They knew that it was me calling because, you know, FaceTime says, you know, Papa. And then, but they never knew when they pushed the button what horrible guys I would be in. But, yeah, sometimes when I looked like Shirley, that was fine, but sometimes it would be lunch and I would have the Shirley wig but the dress would be off and I'd have these weird pads and some of the teeth would be out. So yeah, I've scarred my children a lot. No. Now, you, the, the show is incredibly faithful to the books, but one of the things that I also love about it is that it seems while being faithful, it was open enough to allow you guys to be really playful as actors. It feels like there are jokes and there are riffs that almost kind of came up on set that are played with a little bit more rather than just being solely faithful to the books. Yeah, we didn't want to make the book feel like some biblical tome or something that we had to be ridiculously strict to. Um, and Daniel Handler, who wrote the books under the pen name of Lemony Snicket, is one of the executive producers. And so uh, if we wanted to change anything, we would clear it through him, and he was very open to it. The show gets to be musical in a way that the books can't. So um, in some ways it's operatic, and then there, there's a lot of music under, musical underscore underneath things, and I think that sort of keeps the momentum alive in a way that they, you probably couldn't do in the books. There's some self-referential things. We talk about streaming media, and, and we talk about Uber and certain weird things, but. Well, like right away in the trailer, there's the, there's the joke about the hourglass, and you say, <laughs> I bought this online. You know, I wasn't sure how long it would last. Well, that was an interesting thing when we're filming it because when you read the books, at least when I read the book, I, I, I felt that it was an older time period because you're dealing with Olaf's mansion and you're dealing with, with children on Briny Beach and they take a trolley there. And so you think, what is it, the 40s or 50s? It can't, but it's not. It's, it's intentionally timeless. 
Daniel wanted to create a world through the eyes of a children, that, uh, eyes of children that was fantastical in a way, and ironic in a lot of ways, and educational but also morose. And so when we're filming it, we had to think: what, what were the costumes? How you know were, are they from a singular period? Because no one had cell phones, but we'll use walkie-talkies. And one of the walkie-talkies will be an old classic walkie-talkie, and one will be one that you could get at Radio Shack. So we're some of I'm wearing turtlenecks and sort of throwback jackets and stuff. So we sort of mixed a bunch of time periods together. So it allowed us to be able to talk about streaming media without it seeming totally off topic. And yet it, it allowed us the world that didn't have to include iPads. And uh, in that way, it sort of feels a little like a, like a lot like Wes Anderson to me in some ways, where it really takes place in its own world, very fable-like, but at the same time, no specific time period. I love that. I love Wes Anderson. I think he's just amazing. And, and clearly, when you watch one of his movies, the, the screen is a character. So you have all of the, the actor people. But you also have great symmetry and great stillness and confidence in the shot selections. But before Wes Anderson there was. was Barry Sonnenfeld. And he is the executive producer of this. He is the director of half of the episodes. He is the heart and spirit of this. And he did the Adams Family, Adams Family movies, the Men in Black movies, uh, Pushing Daisies. And he has a real specific aesthetic. He was a director of photography for the Coen Brothers movies in Raising Arizona. And so while I hear Wes Anderson and appreciate it, I have to pivot to Barry because really this is his world and he's extraordinary and he's such a lovely and odd man with a great sense of humor and it's really, I'm proud to be part of his brain. I was making my way to Barry. <laughs> yeah, we all are. He's uh, he's amazing, and I would say, <laughs> it, it, you know, he has an incredible resume. I personally, I think this is the best thing that I've seen him. I've seen him do. It takes everything that he's wonderful at, and it sort of gives him free reign. It feels like Barry's a pretty cynical man, <laughs> and he has been through a lot of chapters in his life professionally that were hampered by circumstance. Um, big giant movies that didn't do so well. Uh, what was the um, the Wild Wild West, which was supposed to be this gigantic bajillion dollar movie, and it didn't beget a sequel and things like that, right? He so he was supposed to direct the original movie, right? The he Olympic was movie. directing the the movie that they were going to make in two thousand three, and uh, and while they were building sets and stuff, he was fired from that because they had disagreements. Daniel Handler, who was writing the movie, was fired from that as well. So the two of them, in a weird way, this is a great redemption story for them. But they came at it, at least at the beginning, I was aware of it, very skittish. They were assuming that the other shoe was going to drop at some time. They were just a little um, beaten. And then Netflix was this new thing that they didn't know about. And they're so uh, overwhelmingly impressed, if I may speak for them, at how Netflix gave them the creative freedom, the financial resources, the artistic resources to make what they actually really wanted to make. I don't think they would have been able to make the movie that they wanted to make, given the constraints of how movies worked. And so they had learned lessons, both good and bad, from their past. And, and I think by the end, and getting to watch what they were actually able to accomplish, they feel like this is something that defines them in a new and unique way. The Netflix uh, ideal is super strong. And I think it's cool that we're doing this and that this is live streaming and everything because that is the world, is a commercial free world where you uh, pay for things that you want to watch. Netflix chooses a lot of content and when and that's where they make they spend a lot of time if they're going to commit to a project whether it be uh, stranger things or the crown they'll commit to the project and then give you the money and the time and the resources and then walk away and let you do it they 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 figure out the metrics of who should be involved and then they let you do it and they don't stand around and question things and nickel and dime things and then you keep having to make 
kind of what you wanted to make, it's, it's really freeing creatively. And you, get, and you end up getting great people to be involved with it. And it kind of does feel like, well, I hope that it is, as someone who likes artist-driven work, that that is kind of the future, because it feels like audiences, even the most mainstream of audiences, have grown a little tired of what feels like product made by committee in many ways. Like you can see with Stranger Things, with a series of unfortunate events, with The Crown, that these were things made by a group of artists who truly wanted to tell the best story possible. And you're, in a, you're uninterrupted because of the lack of commercials. And I think it makes for a more discerning audience. When I sit down to watch TV now, I will go to my Apple TV and I will see what I want to watch and I will find it and I will order it and I will watch it. Have I don't been... have to sit there and watch something and then it stops and then there's a Tampax commercial and then, and then there's, you know, a <laughs> Crackers commercial and then a video game thing and then I'm back to the story. And then there's ads for other shows that I'm supposed to watch. Like, I think we are able to now watch what we want to watch. So, Chef's Table. That's, a that's great... what you watch? That's your show? Oh, we love the Chef's Table. <laughs> Food porn is the best. Are you, I mean, it's a, it's yeah, a, it's a cliche. Yeah, I'm married to a chef. Oh, right. And, and, and he has got my palate, uh, has expanded it entirely. And our kids have great palates, too. And my favorite thing to do is go eat at a new restaurant and have the chefs just bring out food. Thankfully, I don't have food allergies. And so they, and I, if I look at a menu, I'll tend to order the same things. But if they just bring out amazing food and it's, just, it's theater and you're kind of throwing the gauntlet down, show me what you got, chef, and they bring out thing after thing, that's the best. And chef's table, the cinematography is sick. Uh, let's talk about your performance as, as Count Olaf, let's. because you do an amazing job of, once again, being self-referential and at the same time being sometimes as big as Count Olaf has to be, but without sort of distracting us or pulling us out of the story. I imagine it's a pretty tight rope to walk in terms of uh, a per being a performer. It was both hard and super duper easy because Olaf is supposed to be very base and you don't need to understand where he came from and he doesn't ever realize his misgivings and change. So you just got, I just got to be awful and uh, at certain points be actually mean and awful. And, and you need him to be vile in order to validate and justify why these kids don't just leave or why they're so afraid and you know, it, it's part of the engine of it. So that was easy to go in and just be nefarious and horrible and awful. At the same time, you had to be subtle within it, because if you're just grand goon y'all over the top operatic asshole, then I think that becomes a little bit redundant. And um, I would imagine thankfully that. in each book, he reappears in disguise as someone completely different to try and uh, achieve the same goal in a weird, wily, coyote kind of way. So, um, yeah, it was fun. I got to be, and the words are great, you know? They're really fun words to speak. And, and the sense of humor is twisted and sort of dark. And I liked that. I like, it's a four quadrant project, they call it, which means they're, they're shooting for the stars with a bunch of different demographics. We didn't make this content for kids and hope that the parents will just sort of suffer through it and Instagram while it's happening, and yet we didn't make the project for the content to be for adults that the kids would not be able to watch because it was too mean or too scary or filled with uh, cursing and stuff. So I think they wanted like Jurassic World was a four quadrant project for Universal so that everyone can see it and get something out of it. And I like the dynamics of that so I didn't have to pander and play, I'm an angry man, kids. But at the same time, I wasn't just horrible, and kids then would not want to watch it. So, Well, you get to end up finding more about the character and sort of adding that into your performance, I would imagine. Rather than just playing awful and over the top, you get to find insecurities and make him a bit more of a sort of layered person. And be, you know, I got to be drunk, <laughs> awful, which is different from just being awful, awful. Olaf is ter terribly unattractive, and he's and he's a failure and doesn't ever succeed. And yet he, be he believes he's incredibly handsome 
and that he's always succeeding all of the time. So that was fun and random to play, the, the, the juxtaposition of that. I mean, even from the first musical number in the first episode, which is this <laughs> hilarious musical number, what makes it so perfect is that it's not perfect. And there are moments where oh, you're so screwing not up and everybody's screwing up behind you. And <laughs> no one's really that good at what they're supposed to be doing in this musical number. It's, it's just perfect. Which is good, because that's Barry and that's Daniel and that's sort of my, uh, you know, that was our brains all working together. They wanted a song that was bad. We, they wanted us to rehearse it enough that we knew what we were doing, but not rehearse it too much so that it was good. And we wanted to not do it too many takes so that it looked polished. Because Olaf, in the reality of the ridiculousness, didn't have time to rehearse it, was probably shouting at all of the hench people and berating them and saying how handsome and talented he was. And then the kids came, quick, 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 get in, get in position. And it never works out the way it's supposed to. That's kind of fun to watch, I think. Um, I have to ask, you were in uh, a movie coming out, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but the new Alexander Payne movie. Yeah, Downsizing. Downsizing. That's amazing. What was it like working with Alexander Payne? Super exciting. It was in the middle of filming this, so I, I flew from Vancouver to Toronto, and I'm, I have a small part in it, pardon the pun, because it's called Downsizing. The idea behind it is that it's, um, it's a world where they have found a way to miniaturize people, uh, to a very, very small size, and in doing so, then people who don't have a lot of income and a lot of resources can live really large, because since there's normal-sized people as well, you can eat steak for days for a month, because this much a regular-sized ribeye steak would feed you for ever. And you could live in a mansion, because the mansion's only this big. The downsize to it is that you can't become full-sized again, so you have to make a decision as to whether you want to live the rest of your life that way. And so I'm one of the smaller people that um, interacts with Matt Damon, who is uh, the protagonist kind of deciding uh, whether he wants to do that and the ramifications within it. So it's sort of surreal and more comedic, I think, uh, and probably more CGI than Alexander Payne has done in the past. Um, but it's an interesting conceit because it brings up a lot of interesting social questions yeah absolutely that sounds great i mean yeah. you're going from working with david fincher to barry sonnenfeld to alexander payne right is this just sort of where it feels like your career is at right now and you can kind of pick and choose the best things that are coming at you or is it just does it feel like luck of the draw you've got these amazing parts thrown at you i think it's a little bit of both i think i'd be pompous to say that it was the former and that i just get to pick and choose who i want to work with but at the same time it's really nice to be able to learn from people that i've admired so much I aspire to direct, so, and I like, I like directors who are, uh, who have a point of view in the camera. Don't just shoot a film, a bunch of shots, and then let the editor decide how it should be put together. So the Barry Sonnenfelds and the David Finchers and the Alexander Paynes, they do that when they direct. They have a strong visual aesthetic. So to be uh, a color on their palette and to get to sit there even when they're not shooting, and observe and just see how that works, what the dynamics are like, is really uh, a great educational experience for me. What kind of stories do you feel like you're drawn to as a potential director? Um, I grew up like in puzzles, mystery. Uh, my mom was a big Agatha Christie fan, still is. Hi, Mom, you're still here. I don't say <laughs> was in the past tense, like... You're dead. Um, and so I've always liked m murder mysteries and Clue the movies, one of my favorite movies. David Fincher's The Game is one of my favorite movies. I like structural uniqueness. I love J.J. Abrams and Lost and the, the idea behind Lost that the more you watched it, there were codes and if you froze frame, you would see stuff. So I'm an immersive theater fan. I like treasure hunts. So I'm probably in that headspace more. But um, who knows what movie that would be? Uh, you know, I, I got to ask, the Oscars are coming up in a, in a month or two. You, yeah. You hosted the Oscars a couple years ago. I did. Uh, I, you did an amazing job in what I think is probably, I think, the hardest hosting job in, in Hollywood. It looks like Thank to me. Thank you. Uh, would you ever do it again if they asked? Did you enjoy your time doing it? Um, it was something to check off the bucket list for sure. It's, it's a big commitment, and it's, um, it's a bit of a masochistic job. <laughs> To be honest. How so? Well, because so many people watch that telecast um, that there's already heightened pressures. 
and then each of those movie studios have a lot of power and really are angling for years before to try and get certain things accomplished and that creates really interesting pressure dynamics as well so when you're sitting home watching i don't think nor should anyone have any concept of all of the weird amount of work and stresses that have gone into making the singular night happen at the same time there's so many awards that have to be given out and each movie now is so different and most of them tend to be small independent films that are getting a lot of uh, academy push and many people that are watching at home haven't seen any of the movies so then you're having to come up with content that people will get but they might not have seen even i even thought jimmy fallon's <laughs> opening number at the golden globes which was really great the la la land, the la -la -land right? thing but if you haven't seen la la land <laughs> You don't know what that means. It was a really like right on the money parody, Completely. homage Completely. to La La Land. I agree. I saw that and I was like, I, I didn't. My parents have not seen La La right. Land. They don't know what this is. Well, and then they, uh, at, at the Academy Awards that I hosted, I did a whole, um, uh, what was the movie? The drumming movie. Birdman. Whiplash. 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 Sorry. So I did a whole Birdman slash Whiplash That's thing right. where I got stuck and then I was in my underwear and I was walking like. Uh, Michael Keaton was, and then I walked by, and, uh, and and there's a whiplash joke, and I went out there in my underwear, and that if you hadn't seen the movie, it was just looked <laughs> it's just like, oh, ridiculous. Oh, he's in his underwear! Yay. Yeah, I'm doing some bad costume stunty thing. So, it's a hard job, and uh, it was super fun to do, and I love movies. And, I, and I'm real starstruck by people who are in movies because you never really engage with them much. When you see them, it's, oh, my gosh, it's Matt Damon. Who, who but no one ever talks to Matt Damon, right? Because he's surrounded by security people and he's at a dinner at a restaurant in a corner and then he gets in his car and he goes to his motorhome village somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> it's not like you see him on the subway. And so I'm just enamored by all of it. So I, I say all that and, and, and also say that I think Jimmy... Kimmel is going to be oh, yeah. fantastic as the host this year. He's just a great host. He's an affable guy that is sin incredibly sincere, has a great sense of humor that's also kind of dark. And so he can make caustic jokes and it's still really palatable. He's sort of your frat friend that can get away with stuff. He's kind of the Barney Stinson of, of uh, talk show hosts to me. Well, you're and, a great host, too. You're, I think you're just a different kind of host than Jimmy Kimmel is. He is more of the late-night talk show host. You're more of the sort of MC, sort of variety show kind of host, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I'm more Kermit. <laughs> <laughs> I like jugglers too much. Who's a, who's a celebrity that you were most starstruck to, be encounter, to, to encounter in your career? Mm. Jim Henson? I was Good younger. One. He was on an airplane. And I was on an airplane too. And we were directly across the row from each other. And he had, I was young, so I probably, he had probably had no idea who I was. But you I just Doogie couldn't yet? stop. I was, I must have been, maybe, yeah, season one or two of that. And I just kept, <laughs> you, clap you know, on Doogie an airplane, when you're stuck there, you just, you can't stop staring at the person. <laughs> so I would just watch Jim Henson. And he passed away, maybe three or four months after that, so I missed my, sh my shot. But I don't know, Brad Pitt's really cool. <laughs> when Brangelina was a thing, that was just royalty. They would come in, they were both so gorgeous, and you'd, they'd just pass by and everyone would quiver. Beyonce, she's pretty fantastic. I don't know, I like famous people. They're I do cool. too, I do too. That's why I'm, that's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what about you? That's a good question for you, and you interview people, it's, so. It's always like a, it's always a, like a really weird one, and my answer is never, never that good, because like massive famous people, you sort of work it up, and you get nervous, and then they're just totally normal and fine, but the ones who are actually kind of idiosyncratic and weird maintain a kind of starstruck thing because you can't get anything from them, because they're just really idiosyncratic. Yeah, that's true. I get that. Yeah. Uh, let's open up to the audience for questions. Who has questions out here? Hi, how are you? Oh, good. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Wow. Um, this is so exciting. You're Neil Patrick Harris. This is like. I <laughs> am. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, how do you kind of balance um, your passion for TV and film versus musical theater? Because I find that it's very hard to pursue both at the same time. I feel like. I've been very fortunate to be able to dabble in a lot of it. 
And I think maybe because I started so young and I did a singular thing and was worried that I would therefore not get to do other things, I've had maybe an extra drive to uh, make sure that I was able to do other things. And I don't mean able to do other things, but able to learn how to do other things, because each of those are such different skills, right? Making a movie is just a super different experience because you're, you're in a, a, a little bubble uh, gypsy world of people who are really good at what they do, but you're, it's very, it's tight close-ups that are going to be appearing on a giant screen, so subtlety is really uh, observed. Television is a lot more material being thrust at you all day, a much higher page count, if that makes sense. So instead of doing one scene for two days, you're doing four scenes in one day, so you're regurgitating more material, and you have to do it faster, but still make it look good. Multi-camera is the same thing, but now with four cameras. So even as I'm acting with you, I'm aware that there's also these potential cameras going, so your mind's working in a different way. Theater, totally different. It's everyone's watching the same performance, whether you're sitting there or you're sitting way, way, way back there. So you have to figure out in your mind how to craft a performance that both people will get, maybe in different ways, but they won't get, they won't see nothing and they won't see too much, right? So. I don't know, I think the fun thing is to be able to, when you're doing one thing, figure out how to do it um, as effectively as possible so that if you are lucky enough to get the shot to do it, the chance to do it again, um, you've learned stuff from it and maybe try and incorporate one into the other. I've gotten to do musical stuff on film and I've gotten to do kind of filmic work on the, in theater, so I've been very fortunate. Nice question. Can I re-answer you. your question from before about being starstruck? I'm sorry, but yeah, it occurred. Isabel Huppert. That's that was something. Really? Her and Paul Verhoeven earlier this year, I was kind of nice. Like, director of Robocop and Isabel Huppert is pretty incredible. There we go. Awesome. Sorry. I mean, on the topic of being starstruck, like I'm starstruck right now. This is oh, awesome. Thanks. I'm such a big fan of How I Met Your Mother. All right on, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm so excited for Lemony Snicket, but I ha I couldn't have you here and not ask, um, how do you and David come up with your amazing Halloween costumes every year? And could you <laughs> give us a hint, maybe what's up next if you've thought about it? Um, it didn't. It didn't come around. It came about because for their first year, they were just these really fat little baby things. <laughs> And there were two of them, and so every month we would take a, a ridiculous picture with our camera phones uh, in, in some kind of costume that looked like it, the month made sense. So for Halloween, because they were born in October, so Halloween was the first one, right? So we, they were laying on their backs, and we just put all uh, severed heads and body parts and snakes around them, and then we took a picture from above, and there's these two little babies with all this horrible Halloween stuff everywhere. And we did that for a year. We thought that was fun. But then we didn't want to dress up our kids all the time like they're rag dolls. And then Halloween came around the next year, and we thought, oh, let's do a family picture. And so we took one, and then we just kept on doing it. And now that they're getting older, it, it, they have a lot more input, which is so annoying. Because <laughs> when we would just say, put this on, it was just hard to you know, get Car Harper to keep her Tinkerbell wings on. But now they, have, they don't even want to be Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell's dumb. <laughs> Tinkerbell's not so dumb. So we, f we, we slow played the old Hollywood one that we did this year because I knew that they wouldn't really think that was super cool. So we just started having Charlie Chaplin movies on in the background. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Look at that guy. Who's this James Dean guy? He's so dreamy. Isn't he Gideon, that guy? <laughs> So they finally agreed to do it. Next year, um, yeah, we actually do have a, a plan for next year that we thought of that I think will be, uh, be, be uh, cool. I hope they play along. I don't want to give any, t any hints. Are you slow like playing a weird it now? Game show. Um, no, I think I'm changing my plan. Now I'm going to let them be whatever they want for actual Halloween, and we'll just, have, we'll just do like a, a, a photo set up picture for us for this because it's fun for us but not on Halloween, so we're not forcing them to wear Halloween costumes that they don't want to wear. But it's fun. I don't know. I love costumes. I love Halloween. I love being scared. Neil, I have to let you go. Uh, congratulations on a series of unfortunate events. When can people see it? People can see it right now. It's a really good question why you're not watching it right now, to be honest. <laughs> But it's, uh, yeah, there's, uh, all eight are streaming on Netflix uh, as of today, Friday the 13th. And they're great. And it's so fantastic. Congratulations. Thank Mr. You. Neil Patrick Harris, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.